So it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to, to share something that I've been working on for a best part of a quarter of a century, together with a huge number of talented people, uh, some of whom are, are listed down here in the um, bottom of, of the slide, and, and some of the publications which are freely accessible uh, can be linked to on, on the link on the bottom right in the, in the yellow. Um, so what we will do today is to talk about the bottom two million years, the earliest two million years of the Quaternary, the, the last half a million years of the Quaternary and a bit, uh, I won't spend much time on because it has been talked about a lot and it is much better understood than the rest of the Quaternary. So we will focus on, on the, the bottom bits that, that people haven't delved into so much. Okay, next slide, please. The glacial environment uh, comprises a lot of unfamiliar things, including, of course, a huge thickness of ice, uh, up to more than a kilometer of ice advancing over soft bedded uh, ground, which was previously covered with, with sea or, or it was land, but, but the ice sheet will, will simply advance where, where the sort of ice topography bids that, that it goes uh, and create a huge number of, of scour features, moraines, moldings of, of the substrate, meltwater channels and, and all sorts of things. And of course, if it advances into deep water, icebergs will carve off and, and you'll have iceberg scours, drop stones and all sorts of things. Next slide, please. The glacial signatures can be picked up in seismic data. I should say, as a marine geophysicist, my main weapon to, to study the subsurface is reflection seismic data. And thankfully, that they're very good at picking up um, signatures of, of paleo environments, including uh, glaciated uh, landscapes, glaciated uh, features. And these include uh, clinoforms from, from rapid meltwater deposition, cross-shelf troughs that have been eroded across continental shelves but in the Arctic and, and the Antarctic and all the way down to sort of the 50s of, of latitudes. The megascale glacial lineations from, from fast flowing ice, we, we see across cratons, but also on the bottom of the North Sea. Uh, and that's one of the main surprises I have for you today. Um, the subglacial meltwater conduits that we call tunnel valleys are particularly prevalent in the last half a million years of the Quaternary for reasons that we're not quite sure of. Uh, we don't see them much uh, in the earlier records, but it may have something to do with paleo water depths of the basin. Iceberg scour marks are particularly useful in, in, in providing a high resolution record of when there was glaciation around the basin. Uh, and we will show that for, for the earliest part of the Quaternary. Recently, I had the pleasure of, of discussing with, with wind farm developers what they can see in their wind farm 3D seismic with resolutions of, of tens of centimeters, and it is absolutely gobsmacking. And, and we will definitely be pursuing more of that um, in, in the future. So next slide, please. The location, uh, click again, yeah, is uh, the North Sea Basin. We, we could equally have studied offshore Greenland, which we do, or, or offshore Canada. Uh, but the North Sea Basin is, is a, in a very particular position. It's fairly low latitude for a glaciated uh, area, but, but it has got a huge catchment, which is one of the reasons why we like to study it. Next slide, please. So this slide shows both oceanography. The gray areas are, are areas currently covered by oceans uh, and seas. Um, the sort of brown and, and pink to purple colors are basically bedrock in onshore Europe, in, um, in Britain and, and in Scandinavia. And the uh, catchment that, that has fed the North Sea Basin with, with sediments is, is all the way up to the, to the top of the Baltic, down to the, to the Alps, almost to the Urals, and of course, uh, half of Britain has fed into the North Sea Basin as well. And not to, to forget that the Rhine most recently has been, been a major player in feeding sediments into the North Sea Basin. So the North Sea Basin is actually, when you look at it this way, it looks like a rather small basin, 
which is why with such a huge catchment, it, it's, it's received an enormous infill package uh, of sediments during the Quaternary because there was space there and there was this enormous catchment that got progressively or successively glaciated, deglaciated, glaciated, deglaciated many, many times during the Quaternary. Okay, next slide, please. So the legacy view of the Quaternary in the North Sea Basin is one of, we know the bathymetry, that's on the right-hand slide. So the Norwegian Channel is by far the most important feature, and, and we have uh, various uh, interpretations of where the ice sheets got to in the last three glaciations. So that's the Wyxelian, the Salian, and the Elsterian, or the Anglian, as it's called over here in the British Isles. So these glaciations are relatively well known from onshore and also from the offshore, and, and, and we have deposits and grounding zones and, and all sorts of things that, that can be dated with more or less success. So, so that part of the, the story is fairly well known. Now, the Quaternary Basin on the left is the basin that was mapped in the 70s based on early uh, North Sea exploration wells, uh, the ones that bothered acquiring any data up in the Quaternary succession. And it is a basin that looks very much different to the basin that we know today as the Quaternary Depocenter. Of course, the definitions of the Quaternary have changed over the years, but also the, the quality and the, the density of data has changed hugely. That said, the overall shape is recognizable, but, but the container that, that we will explore for the Quaternary is much bigger than what is implied on, on the map on the left. Next slide, please. I should say that there are references on most of these slides, but they seem to drop off the, the screen a little bit. But that, that, that is, I, I, people are very welcome to write to me to, to get references for the slides or uh, with questions and so on, of course. So the vintage view of the North Sea Quaternary is, is one of, of a heavily expanded time scale up in the, in the top part of the succession particularly the, the down to the first glaciation and then the next couple of glaciations getting us down to the um, Promerian complex, after which much of the history of, of the Quaternary is in a bit of a haze and, and people don't really have much evidence for, for glaciation um, from the onshore, although there are the odd occurrence of, of hypothesized or, or more or less substantiated glaciations from the onshore. Next slide, please. Now, in comes things like uh, deep water oxygen isotope records, which provide a different view of environmental change and, and, and use to see and, and glaciation, which may or may not be telling us the whole truth. Uh, and we, we might, in this uh, presentation, argue that there is more than meets the eye in, in the oxygen isotope record, and maybe we need, we need to think again about how that correlates with, with global glaciation and with global uh, eustatic records. Um, so again, you see in this map, which or is this compilation, which shows the, the UK uh, um, onshore areas, uh, evidence for glaciation, and there's a rich history of glaciation down to about half a million years. Then it gets a bit more patchy. But offshore, the northern UK, there is a continuous, or oh, well, there's a long record of IRD, ice after uh, uh, glacial, ice after deposits, basically, um, off the Atlantic, on the Atlantic margin. So, so that suggests there was ice in the UK again and again and again, at a time when there's very little onshore records to, uh, to hang that on. Next slide, please. In comes the seismic data from the Central North Sea. This was uh, provided to us uh, first and foremost by PGS, who have merged a huge number of 3D seismic surveys, and, and they've provided these for academic research. And, and uh, we, we've had the pleasure of looking at these. Uh, several PhD students have been very, very busy uh, trawling through the, the data and, and using software such as PaleoScan to interpret every single horizon in, in the uh, in the 3D seismic data over something that approaches 100,000 uh, square kilometers or more. So, so that's been uh, a real eye-opener. And, and then, of course, once you have all these surfaces, 
you can analyze them for, for geomorphology and for, for what lies between the surfaces, which is what we've done. Next slide, please. And uh, we have all these geophysical records, but we have very little to hang them on in terms of absolute datings. So there's a very, very important borehole in the uh, northern end of the Dutch sector, exactly where the arrow is uh, there, yeah, called A1503, which is uh, very well dated by, by the uh, Dutch researchers who, who have worked that extensively. And we have managed to, to tie that in to, to the Central North Sea Quaternary Depot Center to, to gain a, a very high resolution record of the earliest 2 million years of the quaternary. And that is a, a physical or geophysical stratigraphic record, but, th but these are basically uh, clinoform successions, which can, there's very little wiggle room or wriggle room, you might say, on, on these uh, seismic wiggles. Uh, the resolution is, is a few tens of meters, but, but the in, interpretation confidence is very high. So, so actually having just a few boreholes is very powerful, but we want more. So we have proposed a virtual site survey project to uh, define three to four continuously cored boreholes through this depot center, which hopefully will be a mission specific platform uh, with the International Ocean Discovery Program. So NERC is currently sponsoring this pro project. And we have a very talented new postdoc at Manchester, Georgina Heldreich, who will be uh, putting all that together uh, with, with the help of myself and, and our collaborators in BGS and, and at Belfast. So that is very exciting for us. Uh, the, the upshot of this uh, work is that we will also be defining the top seal and the overburden to potentially huge areas of subsurface carbon storage. Uh, which is where something that could be called blue skies science meets, meets a very applied objective to, to further the, the net zero goals of the UK and, and of Europe, really, because the North Sea is by far the biggest asset in, in carbon sequestration that exists in, in, in Northwest Europe. Okay, so next slide, please. The database is very rich uh, in, in the sort of pale uh, overlay here are the Southern and Central North Sea mega surveys that PGS have, have stitched together from hundreds and hundreds of, of 3D seismic surveys. And um, this is a, a huge, uh, phenomenal database for quaternary research because there is a kilometer of quaternary uh, coinciding with uh, parts of, of these uh, data sets. So we have a number of boreholes uh, of which some of them are highlighted here. Um, but really, the, today is about showing what the seismic can show, and we simply use boreholes to give us ages of what we see in the seismic. Next slide, please. So this is the database where we also have used 2D seismic to fill in the, the gaps between the 3D seismic in, in the less attractive, less prospective areas of the North Sea, uh, on top of the mid-North Sea high. There is... Uh, only a few 3D seismic surveys these days. So we use the TGS North Sea Renaissance uh, 2D seismic and, and other 2D seismic lines to fill in the gaps, which was uh, extremely helpful. Next slide, please. So here's one of the uh, big regional correlation lines. This is from a paper uh, lead authored by Rachel Lamb, who was one of the very uh, tenacious and very talented PhD students who worked on this with us in Manchester. And uh, she worked together with Rachel Harding to, to take the correlations of the, the Dutch ages on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, and you can see the scale bar in the bottom left is 50 kilometers. So, so we're talking uh, 400 kilometers here or, or more of a seismic line extracted from this uh, regional 3D seismic data set. And at this scale, of course, the, the geology doesn't look so pretty. So the line drawing at the bottom probably gives a better impression of of what we have here. So we have these huge clinoforms, hundreds of meters high uh, and many tens of kilometers long. So these are really quite gentle clinoforms, but the seismic have been squeezed up so hard to, to make it all fit on a page. So the vertical exaggeration is quite uh, obscene, about 75 times vertical exaggeration. What you also see here is the uh, evidence 
for the, for the age calibration. So, so that's in the A1503 borehole. And those particular surfaces that are colored are, are the ones where we have a good idea about the age. The uh, 1.1 million years age comes from the Central North Sea, uh, not from the Dutch borehole. So that's what we have at the moment. Now we need to fill in the blanks with, with these uh, ODP boreholes, but first we have to do that work. So I can't report that today. Hopefully uh, this time next year, we will have a much better understanding about where we propose to drill. Next slide, please. Now that is the actual shape of the quaternary uh, basin. This is the uh, total depth to the bottom of the quaternary. And, and you can see it, it ends up at about 1200 meters at its deepest below the present day sea, sea surface. And uh, this is a much longer depot center that was hinted at in, in the legacy maps. And this may be partly to do with, with revised uh, chronostratigraphy, but, but it certainly is to do with having a continuous geophysical database that maps this uh, surface with, with very limited uh, uncertainty. And you can also see that the basin is, is uh, connected to the north through a, a shallow sort of seaway where you have a label that says figure two. Uh, so that makes correlation to the Atlantic margin really quite tricky, um, which would otherwise be wonderful to, to draw in the oceanographic uh, record from the North Atlantic into the North Sea Basin. So that's why we need uh, cores from the basin itself to, to, to do the job. And, and then we have to get over that uh, shallow threshold to, to, to link with the Atlantic margin records. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, with the help of, of TGS, who have compiled a very uh, lovely database of, of boreholes from, from all of the North Sea Basin, uh, Rachel Lamb put together this plot of depth and two-way times to the base quaternary uh, to define a best fit uh, regression line to, to convert the, the two-way time map that we made based on the mega survey seismic data to a depth map, which is what we have presented uh, you, you with here. So, the regression over there has a R squared coefficient of 0.99. It's pretty, pretty tight, tight fit. Of course, there could be discrepancies, but uh, it, it is a it is a good fit. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. So Rachel Lamb, in in her work uh, that, that got merged with the work of Rachel Harding. Um, so there's two PhDs primarily uh, that have fed into this uh, work, which was published in 2018 in, in the uh, Journal of the Geological Society. Um, so basically from the top left is the earliest 230,000 years of the quaternary. And you see the depot center in the Dutch sector of the North Sea is a whopping five, almost 500 meters thick for 230,000 years. So this stratigraphic resolution of, of this uh, depot center is phenomenal. If we go to the next map on the, on the top right, we have 400,000 years represented by a thickness of about 350 to 400 uh, meters. Again, a pretty phenomenal sedimentation rate or preserved stratigraphic record because it is currently compacted, of course, of about a, a meter per thousand years. The map on the bottom left is the longest duration um, of the earliest quaternary. So, so that's uh, 900,000 years, uh, and that thickness is about 700 meters in it at its thickest. And, and finally, on, on the right hand side, we've lumped in the last 1.1 million years of the quaternary into the depot center here, which is a sort of kidney shape in, in, the, in the outer Moray Firth attaining thicknesses of about 700 meters as well. So this is basically what we're targeting with, with our studies of geomorphology and paleo environments, and also eventually with, with the core, core boreholes that we plan to, to insert in, into this stratigraphy. So you, you can see we, we need to be quite strategic here because we have only got three or four boreholes of about 1.1 kilometers each to, to, uh, to do this with. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this uh, is from a study we, we eventually published in 2018 in Science Advances, which was led by Bryce Ray at Aberdeen. It's a lovely example of several, well, in fact, a handful of PhD students and their supervisors came together to jointly pool all the resources to um, figure out how can we best boost the knowledge of the Quaternary and the North Sea, and particularly the, the evidence for glaciation. So we took a cord record from the outer Moray Firth, we took the geomorphological record from the southern and central North Sea, and we took the, the legacy uh, dates from, from the Dutch uh, calibration boreholes, and we put all that together in, in a database. And uh, this is another slide on, on the left here that shows that narrow seaway between the North Atlantic and the central North Sea Basin. Um, so you can see it's, it's a bit of a zigzag uh, connection to, to get any water in there. And, and later on, we will be talking about getting icebergs uh, through there, either from the North Sea Basin out and for, or from the North Atlantic in. Next slide, please. So uh, with Rachel Lamb, we tried to reconstruct what the North Sea would have looked like, like at 2.58 million years at the beginning of the Quaternary. The Baltic River system had been filling in the Southern North Sea Basin since the, the Middle Miocene on, uh, on conformity, so since about 14 million years. That Delta system prograded across Northern Poland, Northern Germany, the German part of the North Sea, and reached uh, the Netherlands North Sea by the time of the onset of the Quaternary. So that is a very powerful uh, supercharged hose of, of sediments uh, draining the entire Baltic area. In addition, we, we had the uh, smaller British river systems co coming from, from Northern Britain and also a little bit coming from Norway. But the Baltic river system was by far the biggest source of sedimentation, leading to an express train of sediments basically filling in this uh, 600 kilometer long uh, basin uh, with cliniform composed of, of silty muds, which are nearly perfect for uh, getting stratigraphic signals and paleoenvironmental signals out of because of the quite uh, expanded sedimentation with, with limited uh, sand bodies in, embedded. Okay, next slide, please. So with the help of technology and uh, PGS had a technologist uh, employed at the time we, we did this work and he invited Rachel and Rachel down to PGS in, in uh, Maidenhead. This is uh, Steve Morse who, who taught them how to, to basically work the ropes with, with PaleoScan and it allowed uh, Rachel Lamb and Rachel Harding to, to interpret every single reflection in the quaternary uh, up to about 0.6 million years ago. So we had 2 million years and hundreds of reflections. So, so you can uh, imagine we have a, a stratigraphic resolution provided by these clinoforms of tens of thousands of years, which is phenomenal considering we're going back in time to 2.6 million years and we only have one really good chronostratigraphic borehole to hang this on. Um, so, so the seismic data and, and that uh, technology really played a, a major part in, in unraveling what, what this huge archive of the Quaternary holds. And this one uh, horizon slice on the right there shows a number of scratches in a sort of whitish gray surface. And, and if you look closely on your screen right now, you can see all, all these black lines on there we interpret as iceberg scour marks. And uh, these are uh, very abundant. All the surfaces colored red in, in the uh, seismic line on the left have iceberg scour mark evidence on them, particularly landward of the shelf break. So once we identify where the horizons have been iceberg scoured, we then observe also a break in the clinoform and often the iceberg scours become a lot less abundant as the clinoforms become uh, deeper into the foreset region. Next slide, please. So that's just a zoom in of the same. So, so I think you can now see it much more clearly on your screens. Okay, yeah, next slide, please. So this kind of evidence was digitized by Andrew Newton, who's currently a, a lecturer at Belfast and also involved in the uh, virtual site survey. 
and uh, we basically were able to map the occurrence of iceberg scour marks and their orientations using uh, GIS tools. And uh, so that was done for the earliest quaternary in, in the top left. Well, it's basically all earliest quaternary, if, if you ask most quaternary geologists. Uh, but you can see the, the level of the resolution here is each of the maps spans about 0.15 to 2.2 million years. And uh, this is a time when people basically have no evidence from the onshore regions that there were ice sheets around the North Sea. Uh, but, and yet the whole basin, whenever the water depth is shallow, was iceberg scoured in this earliest part of the quaternary. Next slide, please. Putting this in a, into a sort of chronostratigraphic context, we have the uh, sea level change from the oxygen isotope records in, in the middle here as, as a sort of zigzag curve with the numbers. We have the magnetic polarity uh, and we have the ages on, on the left here. Now we have the IRD records from the North Atlantic as these sort of uh, gray fingers. And then we have the scoured horizons as these sort of um, dots with error bars uh, on them from the northern, the central, and the southern North Sea. And you can see right from the beginning of the quaternary at the bottom of the column, we get quite abundant iceberg scours. Then there's a small break uh, in SU3 SU between 2.35 million years and 2.2 million years, where there's very few iceberg scours, and also not very many IRD. So for some reason, uh, there was no ice sheets present at this particular time. And then it kicks off again in, from about 2.2 million years onwards. There's huge numbers of iceberg scours on all the, the shellful parts of the clinoforms. Next slide, please. So where did these icebergs come from? Of course, uh, we don't know in principle that there was ice around the margins of the North Sea. They could have come from Greenland. They could have come from Northern Norway. So we, we uh, had very helpful uh, help from, from a paleogenographer who could seed icebergs around the North Atlantic. And uh, these, these were seeded from Greenland in the top left, from the North Sea in the top right, from North America in, in the bottom left, and from Western Scotland in the uh, bottom right. And you can see it's only really if we seed icebergs inside the North Sea that we get icebergs uh, occupying that space. Uh, and this is because that narrow seaway to the North Atlantic is not conducive to, uh, to sucking in icebergs and circulating them in the North Sea. So, so basically we, we think this is good supporting evidence that the icebergs were seeded from within the North Sea and then they were probably uh, eventually flushed out through this channel and into the North Atlantic. Next slide, please. Okay, so one thing is icebergs. They could have come from anywhere. We might say, of course, the modeling suggests they came from within the North Sea. And that to us means there was ice at sea level in the North Sea throughout uh, the coldest parts of, of the Quaternary, uh, right from the onset of the Quaternary. We should also say that we did not see iceberg scale marks in the Pliocene. So the Plio Pliocene boundary really is uh, where it all kicks off in, in the North Sea. Now, grounded glaci glacial evidence is a different kettle of fish because uh, with icebergs, you could see them anywhere in the Northern North Sea and they could float around down to the Dutch coast and, and so on. And, and you just need one point to have ice around the basin and you could then uh, carve that and, and it could scour the seabed. Now, if you have evidence for grounded glaciations, it's a different matter. Then uh, the ice was there, it was sitting on the seabed uh, or, or on, the, on the substrate uh, and scouring the substrate. And the first evidence for that is from a cord, uh, something so unusual as a cord quaternary deposit in the outer moray first called the Aviat deposit, which is a sandstone, which has uh, been called because it contains gas, which Apache is using to drive the 40s uh, oil production platform. Now, the Aviat uh, core was described by Bryce Ray and his PhD students in Aberdeen. 
And this is where we came together with the mega survey 3D seismic interpretation and the geomorphological interpretation by, by Rachel Lamb in the Central North Sea came together beautifully with, with this uh, detailed work on, on, on the core and, and the biostratigraphy on the core and the glacial sedimentological work. Um, and you see that core is from 950 milliseconds beneath the, the North Sea. So it is really deep. It is on the bottom of the depot center remaining or of the basin that was remaining at, at that time uh, at about 1.8 million years ago. So 1.8 million years ago, we have evidence for ground glaciation. Let's have a look at that. Next slide, please. Oh, these are, are just some of the uh, supporting evidences for the chronostratigraphic correlation. Uh, we will do much more of this sort of work uh, when, when we actually uh, get some cord boreholes uh, through the succession, but, but it's just to, to have an idea about the degree of expansion of, of the different uh, stratigraphic packages. You can see the chronostratigraphy is labeled on here, and, and we have uh, depths in meters. So we're talking about hundreds of meters for 100,000 or 150,000 years. So these are really very nicely expanded stratigraphic sections that, that can be achieved here. So, so that uh, is kind of an aside for now. So next slide, please. Now, this is the, the work of Rachel Lamb, who had mapped a, a huge number of, of very elongated, striated surfaces, very distinct from the iceberg scoured surfaces, which have sort of crisscrossing and, and that, that looked uh, scratched in a random way. These are all in the same direction, as you can see with the uh, Rose diagram in the top left of the, of the uh, gray map. What you maybe not can see so clearly is that the map has very long attenuated uh, landforms in it, and these have been uh, drawn out in, in, the, in the line drawing on the large map. And you can see our best evidences for, for ages have been annotated as well. And so we have ages from 1.87 million years uh, all the way up to 0.9 million years. So throughout this time, we, we have about 12 episodes of grounded glaciation. There may be more. This is using conventional 3D seismic data, not the sort of super high resolution data that we get from broadband 3D or from wind farm 3D. So this is uh, just the beginning of, of the knowledge really of grounded glaciation in the central North Sea. Next slide, please. That's just a zoom in on, on the on the striated surface. So these are all going in the same direction. Uh, of course, we don't know whether they came from the Northeast or the Southwest. So whether they came from Southern Norway or Northern Britain. There, there are elements of the Aviat uh, core information that suggests it was a British ice sheet that, that remolded that sandstone and deposited that sandstone on the bottom of, of the North Sea, which is very interesting because that ice sheet, of course, would have nucleated on land slid into the North Sea and sat on the bottom of, of a basin that was at least 300 meters deep at the time. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, core from Aviat. I'm not a glacial sedimentologist. I'm merely a seismic interpreter, but those who have got experience in glacial sedimentology uh, can talk vividly about this. And, and you see those convoluted laminae and, and the, that sort of type of, of sandstone and the the immaturity of the sandstone with biotite grains mixed in with quartz. Uh, and you can see the logs here involve uh, hyperpignal flows and also a deformation, but caused by an, an overriding ice sheet. Um, and uh, on the bottom left, you, you can see that, that we can interpret this as an interaction between clinoform sedimentation coming from the southeast and glacial sedimentation coming from the southwest. Uh, and there's a reconstruction in the map in the bottom center of the ice sheets coalescing um, in, in the central North Sea. And this is a familiar picture from the last glaciation and the last three glaciations. But this was 1.87 million years ago. So that is absolutely groundbreaking. Um, I think people who work on shore probably still doubt this a little bit, but we didn't make it up. The landforms are there, the stratigraphy says how old it is, and the core 
suggests quite unequivocally that these are glacial sediments that have been glacially deformed by a grounded ice sheet. So there you have it, 1.87 million years ago. Next slide, please. Okay, so then we come to a sort of summary of uh, the earliest glacial evidence is at the dashed red line uh, in relation to the oxygen isotope record. We then had many, many episodes of iceberg scour marks in the North Sea until we get to the solid red line, which is when we get the first evidence for grounded glaciation in the central North Sea. So this is on the bottom of a 300 meter deep basin. We get grounded glaciation suggesting the, the ice sheet that advanced into the central North Sea was really quite thick. And uh, we then get repeated uh, grounded glaciations in, in that interval up to about 1.1 million years ago. And yet we only get the, the really strong oxygen isotope excursions uh, since the mid Pleistocene transition. Um, when by the accounts that we can decipher from the seismic geomorphology, the ice sheets were perhaps not necessarily any more extensive than they were in the preceding one to, to 1.5 million years. So there are some enigmas that need to be resolved here. And, and we think more work on the seismic is good, but of course we need some, some proper uh, sedimentary evidence from continuous cause to, to take this further. Next slide, please. Uh, just a, a neat little aside, if you like, uh, this is getting close to the uppermost part of the interval that we have focused on. Uh, and uh, we had a, a Danish student visit us in, in Manchester to uh, Carla Karina Bendixson, who uh, studied uh, the, the, the last glaciation onshore and offshore Denmark. And we, we invited her over to, to look at what we thought might be a glacial tectonic uh, thrust complex, uh, which was seen in some very nice uh, broadband 3D seismic data that CGG had provided, which is inserted here into the greater coverage of, of the PGS uh, mega survey. So we'll have a little look at that on the next slide. The timing we have is from BGS cord boreholes from the 70s, uh, which had uh, magnetostratigraphy and uh, biostratigraphy applied to them. Um, so in there, we have uh, two reflections marked, which could be mapped in the seismic, and we have them linked to the magnetic polarities. So one is about 0.78 billion years, the pink horizon, and one is 1.09 billion years, the turquoise horizon. The glacial tectonic complex sits very uh, shortly above the 0.78 million years and well below the tunnel valleys that, that are also abundant in this part of the North Sea. Next slide, please. So this doesn't come out very well on a, on a sort of PowerPoint and, and there are some survey lines, which are the uh, straight north south lines, which are not in focus here. You can see the line drawing on the bottom is basically a line drawing of, of lineaments that are crossing the, the uh, survey footprint. And, and they are the strike orientations of heavily deformed sediments, which we will see on a seismic line on the next slide, I think. Oh, first we have a zoom in on a time flash. So go back one piece, and if that will stay with us. There's something wrong with the animation. Okay, next slide, please, yeah. Okay, so there are the two familiar seismic reflections, 1.09 and 0.78. And then in, in green, we have a decolman surface, we, we called it, which is where the glacial tectonics are uh, basically sliding on that surface very shortly above the, the 0.78 million years surface. Next slide, please. And, and this is what it looks like when you zoom in on the broadband 3D seismic. The, the green surface is what we call the decolment, so the sliding surface. And you can see it looks like something has come along and it's basically taken a nice flat line sedimentary sequence and scrunched it up it's shortened it by at least 50% uh, to, to like a harmonica basically to, to form these inclined uh, sedimentary sheets, which are very similar to what we see in glacial tectonic thrust complexes uh, in places like Western Denmark, where, where all the uh, sedimentary cliffs have been implicated in this way. 
Next slide, please. Oh, I should say, uh, yeah, okay, I can talk to that. Um, that the ages are suggested by having posterior tunnel valleys incising the sequence above, and then we have the Bruins Matsuyama age pink horizon. So, so we're somewhere between the Elsterian and the Bruins Matoyama, so possibly substantially older than, than we, we previously thought there was grander glaciation in the Central North Sea. Of course, this is not quite as exciting now that I've told you at 1.87 million years ago, there was also grander glaciation. So, but we were very happy when we first discovered this as a early evidence. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, how, how the 3D seismic survey sits in the North Sea and how the glacial tectonic uh, thrust front uh, strikes. And, and we infer that that was due to a Scandinavian ice sheet advancing across the North Sea in this case. Uh, the other uh, colored lines on here are just the still stand lines or the maximum extent lines for, for the last three glaciations. Next slide, please. I can't uh, leave you without showing you at least one tunnel valley. Uh, and this is all the way back to the, the last uh, millennium when I finished my PhD, which included work on the tunnel valleys in the Eastern Danish North Sea and the glacial tectonics. And basically we, we see this sort of level of, of detail on the Dogger Bank where perhaps many of the people here are involved in, in site surveys for wind farms. There's absolutely spectacular glacial tectonics out there and, and uh, tunnel valleys as well to boot. And that is the case throughout the North Sea. So there's this layer of 300 meters of very interesting, but also very complicated stratigraphy. Then we get into, in this case, the Miocene, and in other parts of the North Sea, we get into the deeper quaternary, which is much more, uh, much less disturbed, we should say. Next slide, please. Right, now we come to the conclusions. They are in a hideously colored slide. Uh, so basically we have a stratigraphic record of Northwest European glaciation that is much more complex and, and with, with several issues that are unresolved uh, from having onshore records and having 2D seismic studies, we, which we think we, we have now substantially uh, rattled the, the hornet's nest here and, and maybe provocatively suggest that there was grand glaciation in, in the North Sea much, much earlier than, than people have thought before from the onshore. Next slide, please. The Coast to Coast Mega Survey uh, was acquired, of course, in tiny little parcels for oil and gas exploration. PGS did a huge service to the community, but by putting all these data together and, and did a fantastic service to the community by, by making them available for academic uh, exploration, if you like, of, of the Pleistocene. And we are now using this also for the, for the uh, virtual site survey. Next. The iceberg scours, we found them since the very earliest Pleistocene. So we, we know now that there was evidence for fluctuating glacial cover uh, of the land areas reaching the sea. Uh, and of course, reaching a sea that was substantially deeper in, in the central North Sea than it is today because of, of the depth center being gradually filled during the quaternary. Next. The ice streaming started at 1.87 million years and uh, it wasn't just a single occurrence, there were multiple events uh, and uh, suggesting both British and Norwegian ice sheets coalesced in the, in the central North Sea since at least 1.87 million years ago. Next slide. Or next point. Now the glacial tectonics uh, we see extensively uh, before the Anglian glaciation, so perhaps uh, during the Cromerian and uh, also during the Elsterian and, and the Salian and the Waxelian, we, we get extensive glacial tectonics. We don't see that so much in the stratigraphy before, or maybe we just haven't discovered it yet. Next. Tunnel valley erosion is particularly prevalent since the Elsterian or the Anglian, as you call it over here. There are sparse evidences in the deeper record. Uh, Margaret Stewart found an example in, during her PhD, and we have yet to revisit that one. Uh, but they are evidence for, for very significant meltwater erosion down to depths of hundreds of meters be, below the ice sediment surface. 
So uh, there's lots of work still to do, and uh, the framework has really only been been there, the physical stratigraphic framework linked with the Dutch uh, calibration borehole has only been there for a few years. So we're still exploring what what else we can do with it. And is there one more point? I think it might be. Yeah, uh, and then it's worth mentioning that we think the geomorphological record of glaciation doesn't quite match the oxygen isotope records. Of course, it may be that the North Sea is insignificant in, in producing oxygen isotope signals, but it would be interesting to see what, what similar records from North America would, would say if they exist. Next. So, yeah, currently we're working on this uh, funded virtual site survey to get an IODP mission specific platform into the uh, quaternary depot center. And we hope to have one borehole in, in perhaps in the Netherlands or, or, or in the Danish sector and a few in, in the British sector and maybe one in, in Norway, but that is all yet uh, on the drawing board. And we hope to eventually put, put that all into a, an IODP proposal and, and we, we could be looking as early as uh, spring next year. Next. Yeah, we don't have to, I can come back to this if people want to hear more about it. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions.